daily podcast for Thursday, 8th of, Fe- of April of 2021. A warm welcome to all of our friends, fans, community members, participants and viewers on various platforms worldwide. Thank you for joining us and thank you for supporting our online community here on Twitch. Always great to see you all here on my channel and I want to obviously give you my heartfelt thanks uh, for all the messages which I've been receiving this week. It's interesting that I personally imagined that during the Easter weekend we would not have many viewers but people obviously listen to my podcast on playback and got in touch really and the questions were related to a number of topics that we were indeed presenting and discussing in here during the last week so we'll you know we'll get back to that in um, a little while and we'll have quite a large section of our podcast dedicated to the questions and some of your um, issues and concerns uh, today unlike during the Easter weekend we are having a bit of a kind of a dr- cloudy um, it's not really drizzly but cloudy day it just feels like winter and autumn are back very cold very breezy quite unpleasant really and uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed my uh, weekend we had beautiful sunshine clear skies and you know wonderful fresh air but of course it wasn't to be for too long and sadly I fear a lot of rain no rain so far in London suburbs but uh, you know it just just smells of rain it feels like that it feels like autumnal weather I've had uh, uh, generally a lot of fun doing uh, the two games I mentioned already on my podcast um, during the last couple of weeks and these games are Yakuza, a wonderful, wonderful selection of games offered on Remaster Trilogy and all the other episodes or the you know the uh, installments are also accessible through Xbox Game Pass. The game I'm really enjoying, I think it's wonderful and thanks to uh, um, Jeff Rubinstein for really kind of you know holding a beacon out for the series and telling us all that we need to jump in and try it and I'm so grateful because this is a game that has a multitude of different genres incorporated within that story beautifully told lots of different characters many situations a very very large open world many fighting sequences you have like a multitude of things to do <coughs> but it is delivered within a format of a television series which is episodic and you have chapters each chapter is dedicated to one sort of activity and you're trying to kind of get the bits of puzzle together, trying to resolve the tasks, and indeed, you're always trying to get um, ahead. And what's particularly significant for me is I'm really surprised with how closely and how greatly I felt for these characters. And it's all down to the story, the way the, uh, the um, creators uh, had decided to really uh, tell us all about the former Yakuza gangster. If, you, if you're coming in on the installment three, and then how he's trying to read lead a different type of life with uh, an orphanage full of children who are without parents and uh, you really kind of cl- get closely bonded both with him and with, with the kids and uh, in addition to a very beautiful little story you're also being introduced to the kind of con- contemporary issues uh, that are plaguing everyone who lives in larger cities in Japan so it's uh, everyday issues the usual kind of concerns and everything connected with the way the life is organized out there so very very good everything is blending in perfectly and very smooth gameplay really good narrative and an ideal game to be played in an early evening you know there they, they is quite a bit of action obviously if you want to be tackling the fighting sequences but um, if you choose the story mode which is going to be delivering a lot more dialogue and a lot more attention to what is actually uh, being done uh, uh, between different characters then you are going to be having plenty of fun 
so Yakuza definitely 10 out of 10 for me highly recommending it to everyone if you are not there already just download that remastered edition because obviously if you are on PlayStation you can access some of the installments or some of the uh, Yakuza games but none of them are delivered in this remastered format which is very and truly remarkable it really looks definitely like something out of next gen and you know just this is just beautiful sound quality wonderful razor sharp graphics they just heightened the experience and as we know from Spil Phil Spencer and his team <coughs> the, the present and age gaming is all about the experience and we really want to be um, definitely becoming an integral part of that world which is displayed there on the screen the other game I'm really enjoying and playing um, quite a bit and I, I would probably say I played more of it than any other game in recent days is the Outer Worlds and the Outer Worlds has been on top of my list for quite some time I told you all about it and uh, played it at uh, uh, Infogame a couple of years ago um, as the game was being launched and really they reworked the structure and the game became very very accessible very easy to follow within that massive big universe of different planets colonies with various characters many different problems which each one of the colonies is, is experiencing and I think it would probably be fair to say that we were looking at um, uh, some extension it's like a more advanced development of fallout structure because in in um, the art worlds you're getting a lot of dialogue which is divided into two different parts one dedicated to your character so you can be asking questions based on whether you want to come as uh, polite and friendly uh, maybe uh, slightly um, ironic and slightly dry or indeed angry and abrasive the story will follow your responses so it's the best if you choose just one uh, side of your character and you follow it through literally as you carry on to the game and uh, uh, the other part of the questions is dedicated to the story so many many questions that will be uh, there in order to kind of make you more knowledgeable and also they will be unlocking a lot of extra content so similar to what Paul Tazzy said about Outriders and Anthem and Destiny <coughs> this is a game that you should not be speed running you simply have to be uh, talking to everyone and then unlocking as much content as possible and therefore the game will be hugely voluminous and you'll, you'll be able to you know play it for many hundreds of hours if you are obviously inclined to that sort of game uh, the games like the outer world or fallout are not really for anyone who wants to be completing it in a shortest possible time the games are not created for that sort of activity and i think anyone who's looking for speedruns should just simply avoid them on the other hand the outer world is comprising the elements of uh, open world activities we've seen in fallout series together maybe with anthem and then visually it does remind you of apex and um, of Borderlands. It just does have a retro graphic novel style environment which is also razor sharp but telling you exactly that it is a fantasy world and you're there in order to find out all about those galaxies and colonies which are before you. So very very good game. Lots of interesting activities, plenty of tasks and several difficulty levels. You can tailor this accordingly. I was going for the story level getting a lot more story based content maybe the enemy is not being as hard to eliminate and uh, because obviously RPGs my favorite um, niche kind of area of gaming my favorite genre in fact uh, it needs to be based on a very very strong narrative and the reason I play these games is to, to just soak up the story to find out all about the characters the world and everything else and uh, that definitely for me is 10 out of 10 and hats off to Obsidian Obsidian who also gave us uh, recently another game called Grounded also accessible through um, Xbox Game Pass and then in a little while back they've given us um, Fallout New Vegas which is still considered to be by some people some of the veterans uh, by far the best and um, so the concept you had in New Vegas had been imported to the Outer Worlds but just developed on a much grander much more epic more in-depth scale and uh, really what I didn't like initially was that the game resembled No Man's Sky with you know you coming in and not knowing what to do you have to rely on somebody else and it's a it's a non-multiplayer game as it stands today so therefore uh, the in-game tutor and the clear pointers were necessary this is what it built and it's easily there's a whole prologue in there which you need to enter and find out about uh, um, you know some of the sections of uh, the story through the lead characters and um, you know it's very easy to follow so absolutely very very enjoyable and I'll carry on playing it I'll, I'll you know I'll want to see 
um, go as far as possible and complete it. And to be fair, the reason I've gone back to it is all to do with um, a couple of my associates who are kind of insisting I need to have a look at it. And most importantly, the recent, the second DLC that was released by Obsidian. Um, and uh, it, it had one of the main characters from the game killed. And you, you're you going to be running a film noir style story there with... Um, just bear with me a second. I do apologize. Um, you, you are to be exploring a film noir style story in which the lead character gets killed and you're running many different investigations to find out basically it's who, you know who done it and uh, it looked really very very appealing so it'll take me a little while to get there for the obvious reasons and uh, um, so far the experience has been absolutely wonderful I quite like playing <coughs> the outer worlds later in the day because it has a very kind of um, uh, slow, placid pace where you're not really uh, being pushed into action like for instance in Destiny I tried this and you know lots of fighting battle sequences the, the, the enemies you face in their well and story mission usually come in waves and uh, there aren't that many and it's all about completing your tasks the best possible way is just to play it on a story mission and don't forget you need to be paying attention to uh, uh, the uh, quests as all of them are very neatly laid out, you, you'll be able to see exactly what um, what tasks you still have there, um, and uh, you need to do them bit by bit. Do not leave some of them open. Also, if you are on a colony, or if you are, um, I mean, if you if you are, uh, uh, um, uh, if you, if you are attending to some of the issues which are based in a particular colony, you need to be um, completing all the tasks there and make sure you talk to all, all of the uh, NPCs otherwise it can happen that you miss out on certain um, uh, subplots and therefore you do not unlock another part of the narrative and you miss out on some of the loot and some of the other things which are quite important for the story and that's very similar in concept to what we had with Elder Scrolls series that, you know, the uh, Skyrim Oblivion and um, the rest of them Morrowind it's very important to talk to everyone and unlock literally every single side mission. Many of many of those are instantly available and you need to be resorting to your map and to your quest at all times. And uh, as I said, remember to complete everything which is based um, uh, on a particular planet. Because once you migrate, you go to the other place, it may or may not be available once you get back. So. Right, so that that's really two of my favourite games. We didn't have that many news coming in overnight, and uh, what we'll do is we'll just have a look at what's come in on Twitter and on Xbox Wire. Be able to really update you on some of the latest developments. So let's have a look what we've got on Xbox Wire. We did talk yesterday quite a bit about the new inclusions, the games that uh, have gone to Xbox Game Pass, and as you've seen and heard. Uh, these games are, well, I'm very excited about Grand Theft Auto V coming back to uh, Game Pass because I missed it. It was there a little while back and I didn't play it, so this is going to be an opportunity for me to uh, download and crack on with some action. Um, incidentally, I've never played GTA V, therefore I'm quite excited to find out uh, all about it. And uh, in addition to um, that wonderful Rockstar game, you also have Zombie Army Dead War 4 that game is also offered to us for free this month on PlayStation Plus. Make sure you claim all the games on PS Plus inclusive of PlayStation 5 games. If you don't have the console, you don't need to worry. They will be basically stashed in your account and then once you get the console you'll be able to crack on with the activity. The other games that have been um, added to the list, to the catalogue of Game Pass are The Show 21, NHL 21, Rush, Disneyland, uh, then rain on your parade which is particularly curious considering how you're playing a cloud and you're doing pranks with everyone then we have uh, um, a pathway and and that's about it really so that is about one two three four eight games added a couple of days ago April the 6th so that would have been 
Let me think on Tuesday. So that is really uh, what's come away on the Game Pass. Then we have a look at um, some other bits of news that would have come in. Let me just have a look. We have. Talking Samurai Warriors 5 with producer Hisashi Konuma. There's a big interview uh, there on Xbox Wire, and uh, they said that 18 years ago, video game producer Hisashi Konuma began work on the first game in the Samurai Warriors series. Um, little did he know that at the time, uh, his game would become one of the cornerstones of the Koei Tecmo catalogue, and in 2021, that's many years later, he'd uh, not only be still working on the franchise, but he'd be developing the game while working in his dual role as both producer and company president. So um, the Xbox team talked to him, and there's quite a lot of interesting bits of news in there, so if you are interested, have a look. I recommend the interview. Then we look at the um, other information the overwatch archives event returns with new rewards and challenges so for all of you who are into fps into battle royale or you know like liking that type of shooter there is a lot more to come from overwatch and we've heard some rumors about the sequel the new overwatch being made but i'm not sure whether that's been as yet confirmed by the developer so experience the past while fighting for the future during the annual Overwatch Archives event on Xbox One and Xbox Series X and S. Um, take on story-driven co-op missions from pivotal moments in the past, test your metal against new deadly new challenge mission modifiers, and you can all also earn historically inspired loot from April the 6th to April the 27th. New ways to play and earn, so with the launch of the Overwatch Archives event, you'll also find a new way to earn weekly rewards instead of uh, um, the win nine games system from previous events you'll now earn stars um, as you play games winning not required choosing harder modes and playing the week's featured mission will grant additional stars so each new week will also come with new rewards like query de lucio epic sub sub aquatic zenyatta epic and camouflage mercy all of them are epic skins some very very nice skins on display here on my screen so these are the ones you'll be able to collect if you if you get in and try the event so um, set your feet down in familiar territory with some dangerous new twists take on brand new challenge missions modifiers like invulnerable barriers bullets and heal whoever you're not hitting and enemies that just straight up deal damage to everything around them level up your collection as well earn an archives loot box for the first time you complete each archives mission for a chance to unlock loot like the new legendary outfits of war for zarya genji Widowmaker, Soldier 76, and Tracer. Archives loot boxes are also available for purchase for the event duration. Pick up 50 and then get 10 of them for free. And the archives are now open. So that's two days ago. We'll see you heroes in the alleys of King's Row. So that's pretty good. That kicked off on the April the 6th. Let me see. That would have been this. Uh, yep, that's on Tuesday. Indeed. I've really played Overwatch from time to time, not extensively, and really liked uh, all it has. You know, like with the mini clips being made straight away, you being able to like others and then share. Really, really cool. And uh, definitely um, a game that provides you with the same sort of battle royale deathmatch experience at all times. Lighthearted space survival game Breath Edge is available. So I think we are not getting it through um, uh, the Game Pass. and. Um, uh, Breath, Breath Edge, the first fruit of co collaboration between Hype Train Digital and Red Ruin Software Teams, is now accessible through Xbox. Inspired by retrofuturism, Soviet aesthetics, and dark comedy movies, Breath Edge is a fresh take on the survival genre that puts you in control of a simple guy called the man who is carrying his grandpa ashes to a galactic funeral and suddenly finds himself in the middle of a universal conspiracy. So after an unprecedented crash, you have to find your way across the space debris, death passengers and coffins towards the evacuation point indicated by a suit's sarcastic AI. Together with your immortal chicken, search the ruins for junk and scrap to create what you need to survive and figure out what actually happened. So there are several things you need to do there. First of all, try to stay alive. Secondly, craft your stuff. Thirdly, explore the vastness of space. 
So all of that's very exciting and uh, so that is being shared with everyone in Xbox community and I think the guys who made the game are hoping that everyone will pop in. I think for the game of this size it probably would have been useful had it been accessible through Game Pass. It costs about $20 so I'm not going to be parting with my revenue at the moment but we'll be waiting for some more trailers and maybe some other introductions. Looks very exciting though, looks like a good story. Xbox Session stars or uh, stars of workaholics you, you reunite to play Outriders on Xbox Series X. So it looks like uh, workaholics, TV friendship family, um, Adam Devine, Blake Anderson and um, Anders Holm will reunite to play Outriders, the brand new 1-3 player co-op RPG shooter from Square Enix. And people can fly on the next episode of Xbox Sessions airing uh, on Wednesday, April the 7th. Well, we missed it, but yeah, obviously we can access it through playback on Xbox YouTube channels. So they are all going to be doing it, and the um, episode of Xbox Sessions will be hosted by L. Osley Wood, arts and entertainment presenter at BBC and BAFTA. What small highlights will air on Xbox Facebook and Twitter channels? So fan can tune to watch the three actors in this original dark sci-fi universe at any time. I'll have a look actually, because I'm playing Outriders and streaming it here at the moment, so obviously very much of interest. Uh, we have Season 3 racing into the Rocket League, right? Start your engines because Season 3 is speeding into Rocket League. The new season is bringing high octane content like all new Rocket Pass, new arena variant and the arrival of two titans of the track, NASCAR and Formula 1. So NASCAR and Formula 1 are coming in May. New Rocket Pass is incoming, so Season th 3 is also launching it. And uh, um, the game needed a new car to compete with the readiness of NASCAR and Formula 1, so the engineers have been already working on some fine tuning and test driving a speed demon of your own. So you need to unlock um, Tirano immediately with Rocket Pass Premium, get access to 70 plus tiers, all of new items and extra vehicle and season challenges and XP boost. Oh, that sounds very good, very exciting. Anyone who's into uh, driving games, then obviously Rocket League will be definitely your uh, favorite. DFH Stadium, which is circuit awaits. The latest arena variant is ready for soccer. DFH Stadium circuit celebrates the sights and sounds of race day. So check it out in the ranked rotation and private matches right now. And also you can be doing new competitive season and tournament rewards. Climb the competitive ranks during season 3 and earn new competitive rewards at the end of the season. So that's all good. Season 3 is already live now in Rocket League. So hit the gas and speed your way to victory. So that's really pretty good. We can get it on Game Pass. No need to be waiting. Just, you know, uh, step on it and get in. Well, I'm very excited to discover that Halo the Master Chief Collection Season 6 is now live. And I, I really talked here quite a bit about Halo. We streamed it last year for a few months. And um, I'll get back to Halo, time permitting. But as you know, we need to, uh, first of all, my complete Outriders. And then we need to bring back Destiny and Warzone. But uh, Halo definitely is there to be played and enjoyed. So we have this uh, new season, which is um, Season 6. And... Uh, we're hearing that today we are thrilled to welcome the arrival of the latest season for Halo The Master Chief Collection, Season 6, called Raven. So with this season, we've got a heap of new content shipping out and we can't wait for you to get your hands on. So this time around, you can look forward to 100 new tiers of content for Season 6, including brand new armor, back accessories, animated visors, etc, etc. Waterfall, a Halo online map, now playable in custom games for Halo 3. The Exchange, a brand new game variant for Halo 2 Anniversary, Halo Reach and Halo 4, Escalation Slayer. The ability to change your teams mid-game in custom matches across all titles in MCC, and a lot more. So that sounds very good. And let me see... Well, we'll just briefly have a look at it. Um, we are celebrating the heroic exploits of Fireteam Raven with uh, unique theme armor sets, vehicle skins, weapon skins, and we're adding in ev even more customization options with some brand new in-game back accessories. So we have, uh, um, first of all, MCC development, development and fighting updates. So you will know that we've been testing a lot of new stuff, including a Halo Online map, which is available in Halo 3. So you can play Waterfall in custom games. 
up so I can come see crack on straight away then you have escalation slayer you got the introducing the exchange and you have time content during season six time nameplates hog wild unity 21 so you can get these nameplates they look really cool time seasonal challenges so we have package deal and then reward is another sunrise animated visor and 77,000 xps complete the spree real estate and nerdy 30 challenges double up then reward is gentoo azuri tech suit and 77,000 xps and then you can have best of both complete the point guard and ranked beats everything challenges are uh, rewarded sword and board back accessory and 77,000 xps raven season pass so you know just the list just goes on and on so it's very very interesting season six is here before us and we can just step in and enjoy some of these rewards i've not played halo now and i didn't i've not played any of that season content so i'm quite curious to see how this really kind of uh, pans out become a bounty hunter in a hip hop infused wild west with luck slinger so um luck slinger is a hip hop infused spaghetti western action platformer where luck affects the world around you play as the nameless bounty hunter and help the town of Clo clover creek with a bandit problem luck slinger is now available for xbox one and series x and s so this is a challenging action platformer with a luck mechanic and a hip-hop soundtrack the gameplay is challenging making you savor every health point you have all about keeping your head cool in cool situations hot situations and looking stylish while doing so so that's very very interesting the game is available um, straight away on xbox so curious about that one i've not really watched trailers or anything and we've heard also that borderlands 3 director scott add-on is available from incidentally today and uh, uh, we heard that uh, there is some brand new Borderlands 3 mayhem starting today the director's cut add-on is available on Xbox one and Xbox series s and X director's cut is part of the season pass 2 and Borderlands 3 ultimate edition uh, though it is also available for purchase individually please note that you'll need to own a copy of the base game to enjoy the mayhem of any season pass content including director's cut read on to learn what's in store so we really will read up with interest need to tell you that borderlands 3 is uh, um, a new addition to ps9 services and you can stream it live or you can download it to your playstation as well so now is the time to try i'm not sure whether on playstation you'll be getting the director's cut but in any case you can still crack on with um, some of the wonderful gameplay that uh, the title offers so Dark Just Cut gives Vault Hunters the chance to face off against Hemovarus, the invincible uh, brand new ra raid boss. And this colossal Varkit has long been the staff of Bloodsock Legend. Now she's finally awoken. When you're ready, head over to Pandora. Rumor has it you'll find Hemovarus behind the door. That's been locked since Borderlands 3 first launched. Uh, you can obviously perfect your build, bring your friends and prepare for your most intense boss encounter yet. Only the most awesome Vault Hunters will be able to basically complete and score some of the top tier loot elsewhere you can help Ava solve some potentially supernatural slayings she's convinced that she stumbled onto an interplanetary murder mystery and she's asked for help to investigate some of the eerie happenings on Pandora Promethea Eden 6 and Necrotifeo so you'll have the uh, help of some familiar faces during this fresh series of story missions and score some loot in the process expert tip keep a close eye on your surroundings you may stumble upon clues that tie back to the central borderlands 3 storyline so not just that you will be fighting uh, a gargantuan new raid boss solving some spooky slayings director's cut also includes extra chances to score loot with three new vault cards once the vault card is activated you'll be able to score xps by completing three daily challenges and a multi-tiered weekly challenge with more than 100 unique challenges each day there will be a surprise earn enough xps and you'll unlock some unique themed rewards so the first vault card debuts today alongside the launch of the director's cut and features gear and cosmetic items honoring some of borderlands most beloved fallen heroes vault hunters have plenty to look forward to with the second and third vault cards debuting before year's end so probably they'll come out one per quarter completing vault card challenges can also earn you a new in-game resource diamond keys which unlock a room known as the diamond armory 
located under the upper deck of the bridge sanctuary. The diamond armor is filled to the brim with tantalizing loot. If you want to learn more, head over to borderlands.com for the full explainer. I think this is going to be of interest to Sukapupu. Sukapupu, if you're watching, definitely check it out. You're on PlayStation as well, so you can just crack on with PS Now services and explore all that is on offer. Now the diamond keys can only be earned through gameplay and are not sold separately. Okay, so you can't actually, you know, buy them for a dollar. You need to be grinding in order to get the keys. In addition to its raucous gameplay and abundance of loot, Darkest Cut is also um, absolutely full of behind the scenes content including concept art, storyboards, cut content, bloopers and a lot more. Players can take a rare peek behind the curtain and see how a game like Borderlands 3 is made with glimpses of never before seen content on it, even answer a lingering question or two. But that's not all. Today also marks the arrival of the Disciples of the Vault Packs and uh, an all new set of multiverse cosmetic packs. If you ever wondered what the fate of each Vault Hunter would have been if they joined the Children of the Vault, you can see that for yourself. The Disciples of the Vault packs feature completely with new character models, not just skins, much like the final form cosmetic packs that launched last fall. Uh, you can access the Disciples of the Vault packs by grabbing Season 2 Pass or by purchasing packs individually. When, uh, whether or not you plan to pick up Director's Cut, you can still enjoy two helpful new machines, both of which are free to everyone. Crazy Earl's Reroll allows you to replace the anointment on an item in exchange for some iridium, that rare purple element you find scattered across the galaxy. If you do not know, anointments appear on some high-level loot and enhance the unique abilities of the Vault Hunters. Uh, when that loot is used or equipped by, by re-rolling an anointment, you can make the perfect piece of gear even more perfect for your specific character build. Be warned though, Crazy Earl gets to choose the new anointment and there is no turning back that you can always play to roll again if you are not satisfied. Maurice's Black Market Vending Machine, on the other hand, is cloaked in secrecy. There is no saying where it can be found and uh, only that it will show up in a new location within the base game each week. It's up to you to find Maurice and reap the bounties of the black market vending machine. Think top tier, legendary loot and lots of it. So that's everything and you have director's cuts available through Xbox um, and it's part of Season Pass 2. You can also purchase the add-on separately but either way you'll need a copy of the base game to enjoy the full director's cut. Now, now, obviously, now is the time to pick it up and have a look and enjoy all the add-ons and activities. So, Borderlands 3 Super Deluxe Edition. Well, that's very good. Costs you $35.99 if you're purchasing it directly through Xbox. Otherwise, the price from 2K will be $79.99, so fairly steep. And don't forget, it is also adapted for the next-gen usage. So, loads of interesting news, really today and uh, I'm very very excited about uh, I'm very excited about um, this director's cut and um, I can't even two minds really whether to play it on on uh, um, PS9 services first and then enjoy it or maybe to attempt to purchase some of it I'll you know have to see I play quite a bit of it as uh, the game was offered for free on free days through Xbox and uh, Definitely, there's never been a better chance to crack on with the third installment of Borderlands, but now as it's been added to the streaming services of PlayStation. So, you know, uh, either way, you can have a lot of fun with Borderlands, and I'm quite excited to hear that there's such an abundance of content really coming in with this uh, director's cut that indeed came our way today. So, a few more news that we have here. Get enlisted and dive into the real world war two. So um, Dartless Software is introducing the game called Enlisted and the game's basically completed beta testing while Xbox Game Preview Program is now available for everyone to play for free. So that is a freebie, you can download it immediately and try it. Grab your rifles and machine guns, jump into your tanks and planes and put your helmets on, start fighting online on Xbox Series X and S. So this is a... Um, um, World War II online shooter with a different approach compared to other games you might have tried in a similar setting. 
historical authenticity is very important to the developer, which means they put a lot of effort into recreating all the gear and the vehicles you can use, keeping the looks and battle roles as close to the originals as possible. This includes paying a lot of attention to even minor details on the equipment, as well as the historical ability. For an example, you will not be able to see a Tiger tank in our Battle of Moscow campaign, because at that time in 1941 it wasn't in the service with um, the German army. So um, you still have a chance to try more advanced gear in the Invasion of Normandy campaign that took place in 1944. Well, basically what I'm trying to tell you, they want all the vehicles and all the forces and weaponry to be historically accurate. So you will not be able to see some of the activities like in some other games where you have quite a multitude of different vehicles that in fact would have been created maybe towards the end of Second World War right at the beginning. So, you know, uh, certainly uh, something very, very noble and um, I really applaud the developer for making sure that there is this historic accuracy present in the game from the beginning. Um, the developer says also we want to avoid the tedium that comes with more simulation type games like walking for minutes at a time without any combat. At least it's easy to get into and fast-paced, has a focus on immersive gunplay with a short time to kill and aims to keep gameplay forgiven. On the gameplay side we strive for a golden middle ground before hardcore and more casual shooters. One that you can both spend hours in at a time but, uh, um, but you can also do it, do it alone or in a dedicated clan or in a more relaxed setting with a couple of friends after work. Still play um, a major role on the battlefield. With Enlisted, th the developer was going to put you right into the middle of a massive clash of infantry with 100 plus soldiers on the battlefield at once. Playable ground vehicles and aircraft in part we want to achieve the goals outlined above with our main um, game mode called Squads which sees you and others play as a squad leader of um, AI controlled subordinates that will follow you and your orders be that as in an infantry fire team, as a tank crew or in an aircraft. You can freely switch between your active soldiers at any time, you can react to combat situations on the fly and if you're killed you can continue the flight by assuming control of one of your surviving squad members. This allows you to retaliate immediately without having to wait for a respawn first. For those of you uh, that are wary of AI soldiers in your session, don't worry. While we wanted to give this mode a try, and this it also features more traditional modes. So it's also obviously cool to try various distinctive roles during one battle, like leading the charge as a tank, providing support as a mortar squad or battlefield engineer, constructing gun positions, cleansing buildings with flamethrowers, or raining fire from above in a dive bomber. Enlisted currently has 12 distinct infantry classes and dozens of ground air vehicles to unlock and upgrade. So another major difference between Enlisted and other games is our approach to maps, locations and game content. In our game, in their game I should say, everything is divided into so-called campaigns, of which we currently have the Battle of Moscow and Invasion of Normandy, those two very major campaigns of the Second World War. Each campaign offers unique locations, soldiers, uniforms, equipment, weapons, vehicles, aircraft, and of course a lot more. This has a massive influence on gameplay, uh, making each campaign its own experience, not only due to the significant differences in equipment, but also due to the goals and strategic situations the historical combatants faced at the time. Two more campaigns, the Battle for Berlin and the Battle for Tunisia, are already announced and are in the works. So we envision Enlisted as an ever-evolving online game, which will see major content updates reg regularly for many years to come. Well, I'm very excited and very interested in this, and you know what, I'll download a game and I'll have a look at it because it's free to play and uh, we can do that more or less straight away. We can try it. I need to introduce it to our friends who are in our Warzone community. They probably will be interested, as uh, I know certainly a couple of chaps who like the games that are based on fact. We talked about several that are in the making, and we've not talked about Enlisted because you know the game's not been properly introduced through various other online hubs as yet. It's the first news I had from the developer today. So, let me see what else do we have in there. It says that what's the dub is bringing bad movie night to an Xbox near you. So I'm quite curious to see that. What is that? 
We've all been there. It's uh, the end of a long day, you're looking to kick back, unwind and watch a movie, you start endlessly scrolling through the thousands upon thousands of available titles to dive into The Godfather, Citizen Kane or any of any, any other Hollywood classics. Well, this guy says, if you're like me, you're not looking for the classics, you're looking for the best of the worst. I'm talking about bad movies. The so bad they're good. The movies that look like they're directed by an alien who's never seen an actual film. So, uh, while making our previous Xbox One title, Freedom Finger, um, the gentleman writing is Jim Dershberger, he's the creative director of Wide Right Interactive. He says that uh, he and his lead developer, Mark Zorn, discovered that we share a love of these cinematic outcasts during the long and tedious hours of Q&A. It felt like these bad movies were only the, the only thing keeping us sane and anything better than watching a terrible movie is making fun of them. So adding your own quips, one-liners and running commentary, certainly if you're a fan of mystery science theatre, brief tracks of cinematic Titanic, you're no stranger to the subculture that's been born from this late night pastime. So what the tub is a multiplayer party game where each player overdubs missing dialogue from hilariously awful B-movies, woefully outdated PSAs and bizarre industrial films with their own witty dubs their dubs are then pitted against those of other players in a head-to-head -head clash of remedy. And uh, uh, the players, along with up to six audience members, can vote for their favourite dub. So have about 300 movie clips to play with, and it just really takes the bad movie night to a different level. Supports up to 12 players, and while the local play is always a deal, we know that it's not always possible. Luckily, streaming from your own Xbox One is incredibly easy. Getting connected is only a few clicks away. So if you want to be making entering your dubs simple and straightforward, in-game players can use any browser-enabled device to enter text, sound effects and void. That's interesting. I'll have a look at that as well. And uh, definitely for anyone who is a dedicated fan of film history. But on the other hand, I know some people who are going to Scarlet Cinema or presently go to Prince Charles who in all of these kind of terrible films. I'm not one of them. I do not see those films as anything else but trash and uh, will not be spending a lot of my time watching them or trying to find a meaning in something that actually was being made on low budget and came across as completely pointless. Um, but you know, there are people who are following such titles and considering them to be cult and we've seen quite a selection of these and uh, you know, why not make a game and try to really make fun out of some of, the, uh, some of those dialogues. Um, let me see. Unto the end, a souls like where fighting isn't your only option. In Unto the End, you are the intruder, not a hero trying to save the day. You can level up, switch classes, or find a magic sword. Survival is all about you. How you make it home, the opportunities you create, and the kind of challenges you face all depends on your choices. Those choices, more than 100, impact the items you get, supplies you gather, who you fight and ultimately the home you come back to. But until launch in December, you would make it past many encounters without bloodshed. The new passive run update, which has just been launched, uh, allows you to get home without fighting or killing anything. That doesn't mean it's easy, nor is it an option setting allowing you to turn off fights. Rather, it's a different kind of challenge, one defined by the decisions you make each step of the way. So, observation and not reflexes. Fighting is all about reading and reacting. Making it home without fighting is about patience and observation. In one encounter, you walk into a large room, four jars sit behind a stone table covered with a white cloth. Three of the jars are filled with the supplies you've been gathering along the way, bones, leather and sticks. One of the jars is empty. Reaching the centre of the room, a, a creature bangs his staff on the ground and gestures at the cloth-covered table. Move further in and a second creature roars at you, the gestures back at the same table. So the creatures want to exchange supplies, they are unsure who you are, but they are traders. Perhaps you have something they want. You can blindly exchange points for sticks, sticks for leather and so on. So you can spot the empty jar, notice the creatures for missing herbs and offer them some. Doing so earns you a special item if uh, it's something sacred to them, but they see it as a fair exchange for healing herbs. So you know, the game just goes on and on with first contact, with uh, gameplay rather than the settings. And uh, indeed, uh, for everyone who wants to um, enjoy 
and at the end it's all about immersing yourself in the world and feeling the kinds of things the main character really feels. $24.99 is the price offered through Xbox at present. It's also part of the ID at Xbox package. We've seen more than 100 trailers introduced a couple of weeks ago for that first ever presentation and definitely th there are many games that I'm personally very interested in on that list. The last bit of news is about Cozy Grove and uh, that game is available through Xbox Series X and S and Xbox One. So we have some news from uh, co-founder and CEO of Spry Fox, Mr. David Edry. Spry Fox is thrilled to announce that their latest title, Cozy Grove, is out today. Cozy Grove is a live sim game about camping on a haunted, ever-changing island. Spirit Scout will wander the island forest each day, finding new hidden secrets and helping soothe the local ghosts. So, um, one of the things to do in Cozy Grove is to reinvigorate the island by helping the bears, bears and decorating the island with magical lamps, which work in tandem to bring colour back to the world. When you do this, plants grow fruit and characters become happier. This is always fun to watch. And because the residents of Cozy Grove are ghosts, they do also ghostly things, like change the very island around them. When you return to the game each day, the layout of the island will be different in sometimes subtle and sometimes major ways. This keeps the hidden object component of the game feeling a bit more fresh over time, uh, which than it otherwise would. So this is a game we want you to be settled. We want we want you to settle into. It's optimal played for 20 to 40 minutes a day, and although as you expand the island, you may decide that you want to spend more time in this wonderful cozy place, but you're never forced to. So it's a game that's offering you, you know, sections in which you can really engage with all the activities. I guess the idea is not to make it overly addictive, so that re-emphasizing 20 to 40 minutes a day seems to be appropriate. We want Cozy Grove to become a ritual that you look forward to every single day and hopefully for months if not years. Again, the game's offered through ID at Xbox and you can pick it up for about $13.49. That's on a discounted rate. The full price is $15. That's all the news, really, that would have arrived on the wire. And uh, um, as you could see, I'm quite delighted to see that we have, uh, first of all, a new battle battleground in Enlisted, and a game that's based on historic facts. We can play presently the Battle of Moscow and the Battle of Normandy, the D-Day. Uh, they'll be adding many other maps and many other battles in the near future. Also the most important thing for everyone to learn is that the game is free of charge. You can download it straight away and crack on. And then we have that new Borderlands uh, 3 Director's Cut with an abundance of content. Then we have also Season 6 arriving to the Master Chief Collection. And that's really what really will keep me going. And also um, nearly forgot the Overwatch Archives event which already have arrived there. So plenty to keep us going really for many many days and months ahead. So that's all as far as the news are concerned and now we'll progress to what we like doing the best in here and that's really our community based content and I've received quite a few messages in fact I'll divide them into two sections for today and tomorrow because one part was linked or is linked to um, our discussions on backward compatibility and easy access from wherever you are uh, through Xbox and streaming services on PlayStation and the other is more linked to the work of streamers and what we do every day here on Twitch and YouTube and incidentally uh, we've had quite a number of um, um, our associates who were at the receiving end of really quite a lot of unpleasant abuse and the trolls attacking them with malicious comments and sadly I've got to say that the vast majority of the streamers who are receiving that degree of abuse are actually female streamers and that's just utterly ridiculous. It's 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 abhorrent to see that the individuals who are not respecting the rules as indicated both on these people's channels as well as by Twitch. And I really need I really think we need to be upgrading our laws to um, make sure that such people, first of all, are being brought to book, that they're being seen in court and indeed that they pay penalties, be it through finance, i.e. you know, fines being imposed, or for more serious offences for them to spend some time in prison or doing some community work and that certainly would be the correct direction
protection for uh, some of these guys and we'll, we'll be talking about this in depth tomorrow because uh, I've had a couple of messages from my female associates and incidentally as I've received these messages I also did spot quite a number of uh, Mm, uh, those postings on Twitter where quite a variety of people who I know through uh, online contacts were also receiving that degree of abuse. So I'm not sure whether these two were interconnected but evidently, you know, just like anything else on Twitter, if it becomes uh, part of the daily trend then a lot of people will voice their concerns. But I think the ladies who wrote they really knew that, we, well, they listened to our podcast in the past and they knew that we were talking quite a bit uh, <coughs> we, we, we talked a lot about uh, trolling and uh, uh, how to really curb on it and how to really run a very safe and family friendly network on any of those hubs and I think that probably was one of the reasons as to why, why they asked for help and as I said we are going to be talking about this in depth tomorrow but today the questions were about what I find very very exciting um, in the months to come. So we've had one message from Sally. Sally is in Bristol and she said I really love listening to your podcast because you always recommend some of the very best games that are about to come out and I'm quite curious to hear what major titles you're really excited uh, about. And um, uh, She also said uh, I'm a regular listener and uh, I really want to say uh, well done Obviously, you have your podcast as the new venture on your channel, and it's really great to be able to uh, connect with other community members, hear these recommendations, and generally have a very good overview of everything that's happening in the stream. So, Sally, thank you for um, writing, and thank you for both watching and listening to my podcast. Indeed, for your very, very kind words of praise, truly, you know, truly appreciated. And I think uh, uh, if we were looking at there's two things that I'm excited about. In fact, it's not just about games. It is also about the overall development in the industry. And I find what's happening at present, particularly with the lockdown, to be greatly um, um, you know, stimulating and uh, definitely tickling our curios curiosity and opening up uh, lots of new possibilities and uh, horizons of ideas. And that applies to gamers and content creators alike. If you're looking at titles, I think I've been very excited about Outriders. I really watched the development for some time. I watched um, developer diaries and um, uh, you know all that's come from the developer for some time. And the game's just been released before um, the Easter weekend. So it's been around for a few days. And I could just tell you that the game really lived up to my expectations. I just love it. I think it's comprising the best elements of Anthem Destiny in Mass Effect, uh, doing it in a very original format and my excitement was simply about a game that will complement my personal sci-fi favourites and that's exactly what Outriders are. In addition to that I need to tell you that uh, I've read my first positive review of Outriders written by Paul Tassi who's generally very critical of um, you know, certain things in video games, particularly in FPS and looters and shooters and he's a dedicated fan of Destiny uh, in particular and he wrote a, a wonderful review on Forbes so if you're interested just head to Forbes and or Twitter in fact just enter Paul Tassi at Paul Tassi and you will get his review which perfectly describes all the qualities that this game has he did illuminate on two things which he believed were slight weaknesses but they were completely insignificant compared to 98% of everything else that was just as expected and I completely agree with this view and the, the description that although you have lots of fighting sequences that appear to be similar if waves of enemies come to you, you're never bored they're, they're always interesting and they're quite unlike some of the other shooters for whatever reason I think he suggested maybe because unlike in Mass Effect or Anthem we need to be taking cover at all times. To be fair in games like The Division uh, in uh, um, you know Ghost Recon cover and being silent and stealthy is very very important. In um, I tried this it isn't. It does feel frequently that if you were taking an aggressive forward thinking approach you will collect dividends and I discovered that um, as I played the demo because initially I was a bit cagey and cautious and I mean, you know, I got eliminated quite a few times because the enemies come at you in threes and then sometimes if you are reloading some of the other guys will be able to to eliminate you rather fast obviously AI but still very very powerful and if you're aggressively walking towards them they're backing off and specifically if you are incorporating your uh, special powers 
in the activity so they will be frightened of um, whatever special features you have they'll back off somewhat and then you'll be able to engage immediately each one of them separately so that that's you know you could really tell that Paul did spend quite a bit of time playing the demo and indeed the game and uh, it's like a completely accurate description the other thing he said is what I really highlighted several times here if you're entering a game which is as big as I've tried this delivered in this massive open world you have got to be spending time you must not be speed running and I think people who wrote for PC Gamer for Eurogamer for Games Radar and Games Rant they didn't spend time on this game they were just looking at the most obvious they were speed running it and they were not unlocking the activities and all else that the game is offering and they didn't really even engage with some of the battle sequences because all they've written was completely mented. It has absolutely nothing to do with the actual game. I mean, we might say maybe that is the way they experience the gameplay, but to me, after reading some of the reviews also about the demo, it seemed they were completely devoid of what that game really offered. Um, they didn't really unlock many side quests, they were not exploring the open world, and they find the story to be simple, poorly written with hardly anything to do. Well, there isn't anything else which is more devoid of the fact than that sort of nonsensical statement. So if you've read those reviews, just simply bend them, forget about them. It's nonsense, it's not relevant. And the best thing that you can see is that the gaming community completely embraced the game as one of the best looters and shooters they've seen probably since the launch of Destiny 1. And the number of players online is just mind-boggling. Honestly, that's the reason as to why the servers were melting. Within the first couple of hours, they, ha they already had 130,000 concurrent players, and I think if you consider that people can access it on all platforms, most importantly through Xbox Game Pass, uh, we are really talking about a major, major number of new community members and people who, who are doing it uh, right now, and you know they, they basically like the activity. So they will be completely oblivious to any of those reviews and comments given to us in. Um, magazines like P uh, PC World and uh, Eurogamer, which is very disappointing because, you know, both... I mean, PC Gamer, I beg your pardon, I stated the wrong thing. Um, both these games are really very much in denial. I really enjoy reading their reviews, analysis, and frequently I agree with some of the viewpoints, but I can't really stop thinking that they really want to make sure that this game failed, um, so it wouldn't be a proper competitor with another major uh, loot and shooter Destiny most notably that had its difficulties certainly during the years the sequel is one referring to and you have seen also that in recent months uh, the vast majority of uh, Destiny veterans had um, second thought about pursuing maybe new seasonal content and uh, you know they're just not happy with what is being presently offered in Destiny and you, you've, you've seen it across the board I've heard that from many people here in my community and uh, I've not spent that much time grinding destiny compared to some of my friends here who have spent like three four six thousand hours on it but uh, uh, still I felt that you know there was there was um, there was uh, a lack of new content something very enjoyable and meaningful whilst we were grinding the same structures and getting the insignificant loot that was of no use to anyone uh, I tried this obviously being a brand new game with a new story and um, being a lot shorter than what you have in Destiny. This is uh, um, not a, a, a live service game that has multiplayer and you know all death matches and PvPs and all sorts. And uh, but it's been embraced. The fact is, it looks good. It feels good. Uh, the gameplay is very enjoyable. And although you are repetitively playing certain battles when you lose, i.e., when you get killed, they do not feel. Um, you know, they do not feel at all boring, repetitive, or pedestrian, mundane, and, you know, I, I've, I've done, well, quite a number of them, as I was being killed by some of the bosses there, and uh, they were always enjoyable. I really enjoyed the activity. I enjoyed being eliminated and needing to redo the whole thing, which doesn't happen frequently in many of these games. So, uh, to, to go back to Sally and uh, uh, what you, you, you asked, I really like... Um, I tried this. This was the game I was very excited about. Uh, certainly, uh, the main big exciting game to come out within the first quarter, and uh, you know, really absolutely tip top. Uh, the other one is the installments, uh, DLCs, and all else that are being introduced in Elder Scrolls Online. I've not really looked into them 
in depth as yet, but um, the trailers, the developer diaries, and all we've seen and heard through Xbox channel on YouTube are giving us quite a, a, a wide range of new inclusions and the the you know the narrative the story is changing we have loads of things being brought in and i think elder scrolls online are becoming a bit like um a major extension of what we experienced in the regular usual series and that's for me what was lacking it, it felt like a different elder scrolls world uh, you know anyone who was a uh, uh, a veteran of Oblivion and Morrowind and Skyrim would have told you we liked it but there was this but at the end and I think with new DLCs they're trying to kind of um, make it flourish a bit more to be kind of to blossom you know in full and uh, so I'm very excited uh, to see how all of that is to unfold and I need to really download yet again I'll just close the line uh, to my consoles and uh, maybe try it a bit which is it's a time factor you know all these games really require a lot of input and I personally do not like playing games, so I would feel that I'm doing them disservice. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll like uh, about what, what, what my, my current system is. I download everything that is being freshly released on Game Pass and uh, PS Now services, and I try the games. I have a look at them initially just to get the flavour of you know what's happening in there, and then once I come back to them, if I want to play them, I want to you know experience everything. I mean, pff, it'd be completely nonsensical to to go into the outer worlds and just flimsily do two or three missions, then you know ditch it, come back in three years. That's not the way to be. It's not doing justice either to myself as a gamer because I'm getting completely um, irrelevant, uh, you know, fractured type of view of, of of the title. And secondly, it's very disrespectful towards the developer because they would have spent five, six years developing the game, and you know we want to try it, we want to find out what the game's really like, and. I guess from the viewpoint which would have been introduced to us by the developer and not to do something from, you know, um, something that we personally would have preferred or liked. It's the best example with, with Anthem because they were asking initially for everybody to uh, to play on the hardest difficulty level in order to unlock special events and cataclysms which we had during the demo era of VIP and open demo and you have lots of people not wanting to do that and they also said you need to be doing it from the hardest difficult level and you need to be doing it as a three piece or four piece because if you are doing it in the squad and if you are unlocking everything through I mean if you are doing it through the hardest difficulty level you will be unlocking uh, all the interesting content that we are providing and uh, unless you do that you're not getting that extra content so you know it just tells you you need to be following uh, the line that the developer is pursuing it's not always going to work, and I listened to um, Larry Kribb's interview with uh, Josef Faris, the legendary Swedish uh, game creator, and uh, uh, he actually raised this issue. He said it's not always that uh, you know you'll get uh, the games, uh, the gamers, uh, community members picking up on the threat because perhaps they want to do something else. They th we're living in in the world of gaming where lots of options are given. We can play this character this way or another, and uh, you know. It's it's something that I guess some developers will have a difficulty with because, like for fa in Faris's games, you're always playing as a co-op. You have like, two people doing it together, and uh, Larry said he always felt that one needs to choose a community member who would who who will be playing the game together with him, literally throughout, so they have continuity and they know exactly what they're doing. And that that will be sometimes a bit difficult, uh, depending on. Um, you know, when you play the game, and depending on whether your community is regional or local, or whether they're global. But coming back to the earlier point, uh, these games require thorough attention, and you can always choose games like Undertale or you know linear, small, uh, retro-looking games, and Narita Boy is the other. You can always throw them in, play them for 20 minutes, 40 minutes, depart, go back in on another day the small very enjoyable platformers uh, through which you are going to be well, getting acquainted with certain tasks get to know the story as it is the case in Undertale but uh, trying to do several big open world games together is just n you know not an option so anyway my recommendation to you all is simply if you enter the outer worlds or 
Elder Scrolls Online. Don't do it flimsily. You know, do everything bit by bit. Collect your quests them thoroughly. Talk to all the NPCs, and spend some time in there. Which means these games will need to be played in large chunks. You're talking about maybe two or three hours dedication to um, each title, and you need to get that continuity. Without the continuity, everything is just completely pointless. Happened to me a few times that I departed from certain games. Oblivion, I remember doing, and then I migrated to some other games and came back to it. And it was so difficult to pick up the pieces, I had to replay the whole game from the beginning. And, um, you know, always best advice not to. So, yeah, coming back to the titles I'm really excited about, there's two, well, mentioned two, obviously, I tried this um, uh, just out, so I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. And I'm still waiting for a few technical issues to be sorted because they were causing us hiccups during the weekend. And then I'm also looking at Elder Scrolls Online, all the DLCs. I'm also excited about a new DLC for the Outer Worlds. I'm just, you know, doing the game at the moment, but there are two DLCs there. The new one has just come out, so I'm very excited about it. Really want to find out what it's like. And uh, to be fair, just after reading my news today, I'm very excited about Enlisted, a free game with those incredibly important Second World War battles. Um, and, you know, want to find out what this is like, because I've played all the other tactical simulation, military simulation games, and this one sounds very good. And it's not a multiplayer, you're playing against AI, and, uh, you know, that sets up a particular kind of uh, precedent in terms of how you're going to be eliminating the enemies and what you're going to be doing. And uh, um, we need to see what the AI is like, first of all. And uh, uh, so it's it's like a new thing which is down top of my list. I've just written it um, in my book as I was doing the news today. And it's great, you know, you go through the news and discover something that really kind of grabs you, and at least it really grabbed me straight away. Uh, needless to say, I guess the biggest, the most exciting game uh, for myself in the course of the first half year of 2021 will be Mass Effect Legendary Edition that will be released next month. Um, a dedicated veteran and fan of Mass Effect played it really uh, incessantly um, uh, during its uh, release, and um, not going back to it in full, really, to be fair. We, we had some Mass Effect streams here on my channel, but I've not been replaying the whole trilogy, and incidentally, as they're doing the uh, as they're doing the Legendary Edition, I'll be able to embrace and, uh, you know, crack on from the beginning. Very excited about all the differences, new inclusions, reworkings uh, on the remaster. I've gone through the list the other day here on my podcast and I've told you all about what we are to be expecting. They didn't really provide us with every one of these. They said they are keeping some things in there really to um, under the wraps to be a surprise once the game comes out. And um, to be fair, uh, I, I couldn't think of any other game that would be more deserving a full remaster, particularly Mass Effect 1 because it was the old gen game that didn't perform too well on consoles when released and uh, you know but obviously attracted lots of followers and uh, the sequel and the third installment a massive success and it's a game that needs to be played together as a trilogy you really want to be because obviously the story is uh, um, continuing from one installment to another and you know you need to follow the thread you need to know exactly what's going on uh, so really excited about it. I've, I've seen clips and um, uh, various other bits and pieces uh, coming out from Bioware and uh, it did seem that you know there's a very very major jump in terms of the gra quality graphics and movements and aiming and all sorts there as far as the first installment was concerned but uh, it'll provide us with a multitude of activities it'll uh, rework the um, I guess the ge generational gap because people that played Mass Effect 13 14 years ago and uh, We'll have new community members popping in, and we'll be able to build, you know, new bonds and new friendships, and maybe create new channels here on Twitch that were just dedicated to Mass Effect because it really has been absent. I have to say that Mass Effect on Twitch is present, but I didn't didn't have um, the feeling of that incredible community that's kind of watching the game and connecting every single day, like what we had with Destiny. Not sure why, really. I have some uh, associates and friends who are streamers and they always have viewers who are kind of their community members and regulars but they were not as much Mass Effect specific and I've not seen certainly in the last four years a session of Mass Effect that would generate maybe 10, 15, 20,000 viewers concurrent viewers this is and uh, um, there may be reasons for that but I'm certainly hoping that with the re-release -re we are going to be able to uh, uh, re-engage with the titles and um, bring in lots of new friends and fans so a perfect 
addition to what we have here on the channel you know with our triders and with destiny one and two can't think of any, anything better and mass effect could then be seen as yet another game that we are very closely aligned to um, creating a backbone obviously for this channel and our community the last thing i'm excited about and sadly i could say that anthem presently has been put on hold they said that this continued the present current works but I think everyone in industry is misreading this. Anthem's not been ditched. They do not have the resources for um, you know a part of their team to be working just on Anthem at present in view of the pandemic and in view of the fact that they're working on Dragon Age and Mass Effect new titles, which require a huge amount of uh, um, input from everyone at Bioware. Anthem rework, Anthem reboot is what I want to see, if not this year, then certainly for the next two or three years. And I love the game. I think it's been unjustifiably slated. Um, there were lots of technical issues, but the game itself is a very, very good game and thoroughly enjoyable. Anyone who is a Bioware fan, anyone who played Neverwinter or Mass Effect or Dragon Age will tell you. We, we you know, recognize the signatures straight away and they made that flying so enjoyable, the javelin suits and we had lots of fun with battles, the fantastic, some of the best ever battle sequences in a sci-fi uh, game, and um, the list just goes on and on. So I'm waiting to see uh, what will happen with this reboot, because presently it's been cancelled and put on hold, and some of the members have departed from the company, other people brought in, and I think too much has been read into this. I personally do not believe that Bioware will allow Anthem to fail in the long run, and don't forget, trends are very very susceptible to the hype which is created on twitter and um, reddit and therefore if you had something fantastically well conceived and introduced or maybe blending in with some other release then you know there could be bingo and the title could be brought back straight away they also could introduce for instance uh, dlcs and maybe extra content given for free to everyone who already had the original game and it could be incorporating it with the reboot, you know, so people who do not own the game, they'll buy the full pack and others could get it for free. I mean, there's lots of things they can do. Anyway, and the last, but not the least really, is reworkings of Cyberpunk. I was very excited about Cyberpunk 2077 last year and sadly, as you know, the game's not still performing as it should. They've spent last um, three or four months working on patches and improvements and everything else. So I really look forward to that, that being the most significant reworkings of the game and uh, having its full functionality on the tech side of things as well as a fully fetched story, maybe some DLC, maybe some extra content placed in that massive big open world. So that is also what I'm very excited about. I love CD Red, Project Red, and I think they kind of shot themselves in foot somewhat with that release being perhaps a bit premature compared to what we all expected and um, you know just the game looks incredible and it has huge potential and I never ever in my life wanted any potential anywhere to be wasted and it's so easy for that to happen in video gaming without negative publicity I can't help thinking that people really wanted those two Polish developers to fail you know um, CD Projekt Red with their first major AAA blockbuster title entering the big league of Bethesda and Bioware's and you know the uh, heavyweights um, and um, people can fly with that riders and you will know them Polish developers coming into the um, you know uh, the area of the industry which is being run by some of the very majors and um, the titles also kind of I guess being pitched in order to compete uh, our riders with Destiny most notably maybe with Fallout to a degree as well, you know, with Fallout 76 um, and uh, with uh, uh, CD Projekt Red and Cyberpunk quite a selection of Ubisoft games, you know, with Watch Dogs Legion for instance, Sirius and Ghost Recon and all that, so it's the concept of the big open world and so you need to be stealthy, you need to be sneaky and maybe some other looters and shooters, I don't know, really hard to tell because um, my, um, Cyberpunk uh, does have also that versatility which is really needed but it still doesn't seem to be performing. So I'll, I'll be excited about all the works and all the DLCs and all the patches. And most importantly, I'll be, you know, elated to see that the game works perfectly on the tech side of things. Therefore, we can enjoy the content. The content can be spoiled very seriously if 
there is a serious technical issue and sadly we've seen that with almost every one of the major releases. Talking of disappointments, although Saladin asked me this, um, the, um, I guess the disappointment for me has been my own personal experience of Watch Dogs Legion and uh, I had huge expectations and certainly was very very um, happy to see that um, the game of that magnitude was to take place in London and they talked about London being fully recreated and having infinite number of characters can be selected for factions I played it quite extensively as it was offered for about five or six days for free and I've got to say that all the critical views that were being said and expressed in various magazines were actually accurate so compared to what we've seen and heard about Artritis, you know, for Watch Dogs Legion, it was a Ubisoft game, and they they were accurate. And uh, there was a major problem between, or there is a major problem between, the plot and the open world. It doesn't feel fully jointed. And you know, I'm hoping that they will rework this and that uh, things are going to, you know, begin to work narratively. And then secondly, I was not impressed with. Um, uh, the animation graphic design. They had three different companies, I think, working on separate sections, and you really can tell the difference um, as you have your character placed at the front of a sign or a chair or a stool, and then you know London in the background. You could tell that each one of those uh, sections of the screen would have been worked on by a different team because the quality was uh, quite significantly different. The characters didn't look really like next-gen characters to start with, not enough time spent on animation or facial gestures or anything. And also the outfits appear to be, I guess, a bit more basic, the initial outfits to what you would expect in a next-gen game. Don't forget Watch Dogs Legion being released for the new consoles, PS5 and Xbox Series X and S. But I think the biggest problem for me was that London was indeed recreated, but it didn't seem to match the actual locations or the distances in the city. So, for instance, you were walking from, what was it, um, St. Paul's, which is almost on the uh, northern bank of uh, the river, and you get to King's Cross in, it says like 250 meters, 350 meters somehow. So straight away you are King's Cross and also the buildings around King's Cross all seem to be kind of bundled up together so the distances have, have been very very significantly shortened compared to what you have in real life and that didn't really gel with me that was disappointing obviously they couldn't label the landmarks for everyone to see exactly where they were but it, ju it just seemed you know it just didn't seem right and I thought this was really giving us um, an idea of maybe cost cutting and um, you know trying to present something in, in a fashion which is very attractive but actually in reality it's 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 a lot smaller kind of world than what we expected it to be and maybe there's some practical issues there I don't know but they talked about getting this importing it through Google Maps and you know have a look at uh, Microsoft's um, flying simulator you know everything is as it is in real life and you know obviously it's a simulator rather than a game but uh, my personal experience of Watch Dogs Legion was not particularly good and um, I mean um, I, I'm very excited about the game still because it's a game with huge potential but I think what we, what we received with uh, the release was um, less you know the uh, was a lot less compared to what we really expected and that itself uh, was somewhat disappointing. I'm hoping that I'll prove myself wrong with the new content being introduced. You've seen that they were giving, they were giving um, the uh, um, the free access in view of well their concerns. The game didn't sell too well, and they've given us a lengthy list of all that is still to come. But um, it just seemed in haste, and um, on Twitch the game is not really popular either. There not many viewers. I remember having that free week uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, I would have seen maybe no more than 200 people watching for a brand new game you know 200 people watching the stream so it doesn't look particularly good but I can see the reason why because the activities were not really tied in properly with the story it just felt disjointed you have that story of that rebellion you have the capacity to be selecting whoever you want to become a member of your clan 
but they don't really blend in together. You know, you play uh, Yakuza, you play um, The Outer Worlds, it blends in perfectly. It's just like a really good brain, good good mindset behind the system which you are soaking up as you go through the game. And um, that itself indeed was slightly disappointing. If we were talking about why I'm excited about um, uh, on the other tech side of things, you know, non-game related, well it's certainly all to do with the consoles and what they will be producing next. It's very competitive out there for PlayStation and Xbox. Xbox is introducing xCloud and backward compatibility on the cloud, which I think is phenomenal. It's revolutionary. You can access 360 and Xbox original games uh, through the cloud services. Nobody else has got that. And they introduced about 15, 20 games last week, uh, which I can now stream through my and Android set, uh, my tablet and my um, mobile phone. Very excited about new titles. Excited about titles which previously were in the original, in, you know, Xbox original format, but being remastered and redone for Android access, so they will look and feel a lot better. Games like Max Payne, for instance. I love that game. I just can't wait for it to uh, to arrive. And um, and also, uh, I'm quite curious and excited to see how Sony and PlayStation respond to all the failings and pitfalls of uh, what they offered so far. Non-backward compatibility, and uh, they're not including the exclusives um, uh, in uh, the um, streaming services. So I want to see what Sony will do in order to upgrade, to progress forward, because they will have to do something very significant. And we did see that they're already adjusting prices. They're already looking at perhaps different types of titles being given for free every month through PS uh, Plus as well as through uh, PS Now services and beefing up on some of the heavyweights. Like this month, we've seen uh, that uh, uh, what was it, uh, Borderlands 3 and Marvel Avengers. I mean, Marvel Avengers, the game they recently released and also offered now as part of the um, PS Now package. So I'm definitely going to be enjoying these games and trying them, you know, obviously having free access immediately through uh, their streaming services. So for me, that degree of competition, i.e. two companies, Sony and Microsoft, watching each other and deciding on what you know, next moves to make, is most exciting. And that is what I want to see uh, unravel in the days and months to come. I'm quite curious to see what packages they would be offering. I'm... Uh, um, of considering whether backward compatibility will no longer need the discs because that's a serious obstacle as it stands today you know still we can we have to be loading discs and you could see xbox series s doesn't even have a digital disc drive and uh, you know physical drive i should say and um, we really want uh, everything to be instantly accessible and also in high quality and how this is going to work, I, I don't really know. But that's definitely what really keeps me going. And also the abundance of news. You know, I remember when I was a youngster, I used to read Variety and the Hollywood Reporter, Screen International. These were my you know, daily hubs of information long before internet was invented and made accessible to everyone. And it was the buzz and the energy that you would be getting. These films are being made. Those people are being involved in this project. That's what's going to be happening next. The, you know, the, the film is going to be released from Christmas. We're expecting that revenue to be made. And I'm afraid that's gone from that industry. Um, and that's all migrated to the video gaming because that's exactly what people are experiencing. A, you have many more participants. B, um, the games have become extremely expensive to make, but they also have a massive turnover. You've seen games like The Last of Us 2 and um, Red Dead Redemption. They had turnover nearing one billion dollars within the first weekend, and you know that's that's astonishing. So the energy, the buzz, the quantity um, of titles, the number of firms working for different studios and producing many titles, versatility, the energy, just the energy. You know, it's like like uh, when you have a scene, you know, say punk rock scene, new wave scene, new romantics uh, uh, scene whatever emo scene when you have a scene that there's a lot of uh, buzz about being a member of it and finding out for yourself what actually is going on out there and that that's what we're experiencing in the video game industry so I'm, I'm very very happy to see that uh, um, we we've come this far I said many times I personally feel that the um, the level of engagement uh, that we presently have is very similar to what Hollywood 
would have experienced in the 1930s. The invention of sound film adapting to the new technology and then running separate studios that were producing very, very many films that were competing in a fashion that was considered at the time fair. Every studio was producing films which were attached to a particular genre with their own crews. Right? So Warner Brothers had gangster films, MGM had musicals and they were competing in terms of the box office figures but film-wise, you know, story-wise they couldn't really compete because they were pursuing different genres just to put it in perspective and that I think is what's happening in the industry of today it's a very very great number of participants the video game production, video game making had become accessible to individuals you know, compared to what we had in the past and you have um, you know, people who make absolutely uh, incredible games like uh, uh, the uh, uh, Thomas Sala, uh, what's his name? Uh, I, uh, you know, chap who made the Falconeer, and we've seen some other games come from China. That, you know, th the game looks incredible. As it, as it would have come from Bioware, and it's just a one person, one person working on it. So, you know, these are the benefits. Um, we can access technology. We can produce, uh, be our own content creators and game developers. <coughs> in addition to a versatility that the big studios are displaying, like Microsoft with so many indie games offered through um, Game Pass and therefore becoming accessible through a very very wide audience worldwide you know with all the millions of sus sus subscribers to the service <coughs> so it means that no longer is the AAA blockbuster the king uh, but we can all see and access all the other games <coughs> and that itself is obviously very beneficial when you get that degree of energy with industry get new titles coming in <coughs> and everyone and everyone becomes then fully connected in addition to the titles we have this massive massive world community of people who are communicating and connecting every day through the titles like destiny for instance which have become a social network so this this is really you know pivotal this is really something new and these are all developments not in isolation, but all of them together that I'm really, really excited about. Hopefully, Sally and other people out in my community are sharing the same experience. Hopefully, are all equally delighted to see that many titles. I guess the only downside is um, time. The games are massive, and we have lots and lots of titles that will require a lot of input. I remember in the 90s, you would purchase a game and finish it quite quickly, sometimes replay two or three times, get on with another. Today is a different story. If you were to be doing Fallout 76 with Destiny and with Elder Scrolls Online, Red Dead Redemption, and uh, the Outer Worlds, you know you're talking about quite a few thousands of hours that need to be spent on each spent on each game. So you need to come up with a system, with a plan for which you will be able to kind of engage with activity that will every day bec uh, become very very enjoyable and entertaining for you every single day. That's 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 the key. And I'd if you asked me. I would just tell you, one major open world massive game like Destiny, one small platformer, maybe story driven like um, Undertale, and then we can also have another point and click adventure game. And that's it. And that does it for me. It's those three types together, which I can do concurrently, otherwise it's not an option. Right, so I think we've come to the end of our broadcast for today. So thank you for watching, thank you to all of you who wrote thank you uh, to everyone who's supporting the channel and listening to us on uh, playback as well as live uh, it's been a very very good week so far we'll look forward to a lot more and I'm certainly looking forward to a lot more in the outer worlds because I've come to a section where I have loads of loads of quests and activities on a new colony I just discovered so as soon as I finish this podcast I'll crack on with some of that well thank you for watching and I'll see you all tomorrow <coughs>